Hi, everybody. It's an immense honor and pleasure to launch into October edition Living Histories with Suk Jun Jun, who has uh, many an interesting story of living histories to tell us. So I'm very excited to hear which selection he chooses for today. Over to you, Suk Jun. Uh, thank you, Sri. It is a really brilliant uh, series, and I'm really honored to be here. Um, so my name is Sapchun John, and I'm a professor of physics at UC San Diego. I want to tell you about what it means to me to be a scientist. I'm a scientist. Uh, I'm a theoretical physicist by training in the field of soft matter and biological physics. I started my lab as a bio fellow at Harvard University about 15 years ago. And I've mostly remained an experimentalist uh, since then. And these days, I study mainly quantitative cell physiology. To me, doing science is deeply personal. I'm a parent uh, and a mentor. I have two little kids at home, ages three and seven. And uh, they make me really happy. And one of the happiest moments is when I play cello with one of my kids. I also have a mentee um, of diverse backgrounds since I started my lab about 15 years ago. Um, my being a parent and a mentor are uh, probably the most important decision factor these days. I've always been lucky. Um, I've made many mistakes during my career, uh, but I've always been supported by loyal friends and mentors and mentees, and of course, my family. I and I had a secret plan to become a filmmaker. Uh, uh, when I was a student, like all physics students, I was attracted to a fundamental problem in nature and wanted to discover timeless truths about the universe. However, one day as a graduate student, I realized that the most of our papers, the scientific papers, would be completely forgotten in the history of the science. That realization was painful. In retrospect, two things saved me. One, I discovered a Frank Taja Jacobs autobiography, uh, The Statue Within. Initially, I was hoping for a secret recipe for scientific success from a famous scientist, a Nobel laureate. However, what I discovered was something completely different. First of all, Jacob never mentioned his Nobel Prize in his book. And the book was almost edged by darkness and starting with his thoughts and memories about death. And his struggles were almost suffering from an inferiority complex to those who are better than him and certainly asking whether he could do anything new the next day. But then what gradually emerged out of his stories was his love for life, an individual, a sculptor, so to speak, who never stopped uh, shaping his uh, inner statue, trying to understand who he was. It was clear that doing science was deeply personal to him, a scientist who is also human. Two, as I mentioned earlier, I had a secret plan to become a filmmaker when I was a graduate student. It started when my thesis advisor, John Beckhofer, uh, went to Lyon, France for his sabbatical. And John was very generous and sent me to my collaborators at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. But I worked really hard there but every night, I almost always end up in one of the small cinemas in Paris. That's when I became a film buff. So I even secretly decided that, well, if one day science doesn't work out for me, then probably I should become a film director and make uh, auto-style films. Here are the four microscopes in my lab. <laughs> Their names are, from the left, Bresson, Godard, Truffaut, and ODR. These are all French filmmakers and there are no doubts that they're all film authors. Think this way. When we did a novel, say, um, Dostoevsky, you can tell a sim. When you listen to Bach or Mozart, you can tell a stem. In fact, the same can apply to films as well. And it is known as the author theory, which was born in the 1960s in Paris. Among the uh, film authors, Roberto Bresson is my favorite. This is a scene, what you're looking at here, is the uh, Godard's Illogy de Lamo, one of his layer films, where he contrasts the Bresson's Pickpocket Cat and a Hollywood blockbuster movie. In fact, Godard's films in later years became more and more like that of Bresson's, especially his uh, use of music. Bresson made about 14 films in his career, 
including one short film. His films were far from commercial success in the Hollywood sense, but he was the author, meaning you can recognize his style based on his themes, the Catholic themes, his use of non-actors, and his use of a sound, which juxtaposed uh, to uh, images, for example. And every film is a masterpiece, and every film student studies his films. And that was when I saw the light that the same is or must be possible in science too. So a few years ago, my UCSC colleague, Arsha Desai, who is also a film buff, and I wrote about the parallels between filmmaking and doing science. My initial version was very dark, but the chart with its warm personality turned it into something much more uh, warm and optimistic, like the ending of the Frank Sajikov's book, The Statue Within. It is thus a coincidence that I became attracted to a, a branch of biology developed in the 1960s. It is bacterial physiology, which I learned from Conrad Voldring in Amsterdam during my postdoc working with the Bella Mulder and Amorf. It was when no one in physics, to my knowledge, was studying quantitative cell physiology the way we do now. The papers in bacterial physiology in the 1960s and 70s and the scientists behind them, some of whom are shown here on this slide, had all the hallmarks of our auto theory because they beautifully encoded their intellectual identity in their work and papers. Their science reflects a rigorous state of creation and logical exercises that lead to general biological principles that allow quantitative predictions. The intellectual honesty of the scientists and the clarity of their papers, if you read their papers, you can tell it's them. I should tell you that their papers were published in specialized journals most of the time, rather than glamour magazines. And but when, but however, they're cherished by many of us until after more than half a century later, just like a Bresson's films will echo in eternity in the history of the film. When I started my lab at Harvard, I wanted to revisit the bacterial physiology uh, developed in the 1960s at some point using modern experimental tools and theoretical methods. For example, we are developing microfluidic device to trap and manipulate chromosomes and soon realized that there we could use it for the study of the growth of individual cells. The device became known as the mother machine and here you're looking at the growth of many individually collided cells expressing yellow person proteins. There's something musical in here and whenever I did uh, see these movies after 13, 14 years, I always discovered something interesting here. Incidentally, around that time, Petra and Levin published their beautiful paper on linking growth physiology and cell division apparatus. So it was decided that, oh, we just study cell size control. So that's my origin story. And before wrapping up, uh, I wanted to come back to the statue within. There's this beautiful passage that really resonated me uh, for quite some time. And as much as the last passage of the book, it's a bit uh, long, so I will not read it, but I'll leave it here for those who may be watching the recorded version of the videos. Um, and for time constraints and other reasons, I decided not to mention the names of many other people who are important to me. Uh, and some of them, in fact, uh, recently passed away. And I've read the complex emotions about it, and it's difficult for me to explain why. But I just wanted to let them know that uh, I think of you often. So that's my story, and thank you. Wow, Sukjun, thank you. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Uh, audience, please feel free to send me your questions via chat. Let me open on behalf of the audience by asking one of so many different questions that are swimming in my head. Um, it seems almost obligatory to ask a first question about the fluid boundary between art and science as you see it. Um, my question to you, Sukjun, is um, do you have wisdom to share with especially people who are in their formative years about how to still remain an artist while aspiring to become a scientist in this community? <laughs> that was a really hard question. Um, well, um, I mean, in mathematics, I think it's almost a cliche that uh, um, 
the, the people see uh, math and music, such as a box fugues, for example. Uh, but I think uh, the fundamental, uh, the sharing point is that uh, we are attracted to something beautiful in nature and that art, of course, is about beauty. One of the themes about art is the beauty. And I think as a scientist, uh, one of the reasons we're attracted to that uh, um, uh, for the regions. So I don't have any particular advice, but as, as long as we remain truth to what we do, I think uh, we'll just stay as uh, appreciative of both art and science. That's how I feel. Um following up with um early childhood influences that made you explore these trajectories you didn't talk very much about them and usually speakers do is there any particular aspect you'd like to highlight because of which you are interested in both of these um you know disparate to many aspects of uh, doing creative work art and science Uh, I did really talk about my childhood. Uh, what I can tell you is that the, uh, you know, I'm a Korean and I grew up in Korea. Uh, around that time in Korea, in my generation, I think uh, in, the, the, uh, in the school, we always uh, uh, learned idealized things, the concepts. So music and art was definitely one of those, and philosophy another, poetry is another, and science is another. So since I was a kid, in my case, I knew that I wanted to become a, 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 a scientist. Um, and at some point, I actually dis discovered the music, classical music, and my very first Bach was actually the, uh, he's a cello Swiss by Pablo Casals, and I think I was like age 13 or something like that. And somehow uh, this been really uh, stuck with me. Uh, uh, and I wanted to understand actually the other, uh, the box music in a deeper way. And just the, my, just the way uh, uh, my upbringing actually happens to be. So. Thank you. Uh, last question. Um, my sense based on this talk is that the vibe there is here and in the science is that of slow cooked food. The tempo is slow or comfortable, meditative. Uh, how do you manage uh, to keep, keep that uh, aesthetic in the breakneck speed with which the business of science works? What's the secret? I mean, to be honest, it's really hard. Um, uh, so uh, what... <laughs> Uh, the challenge here is that the, uh, the rest of us, we work really hard in the lab, uh, uh, to be clear. And then I have students who really dedicate themselves uh, uh, day and night in their science. At the same time, uh, the rest of the world moves really fast. And then we have a lot of constraints about the, uh, the funding and uh, you know, publish or perish culture and so on. So I, what I do personally is that, in fact, uh, I go back to the statue within every now and then. Um, I read uh, whenever I feel okay, uh, uh, really emotionally you know, uh, uh, drained uh, because I'm just too tired of handling all the constraints and so on. And I try to protect the uh, students and postdocs in my lab by creating a protective environment. And uh, uh, you know, apart from that, uh, uh, you know, just as best as I could. So going back to the basics. Thank you so much, Sukjun. So much food for thought in so many different media. Really appreciate it. And thanks again on behalf of the audience. Thank you.